when I first started, when I first started, I, um, you're always after big guys. It was always about size and strength, toughness. And in the last 15 years, that part has actually really changed. And then when I got to work with Steve Eisman, it was just a, an eye opening kind of idea of what, what he wanted. And he didn't, we got away from size wasn't a requisite. He, he said, listen, I want, I want skating. I want skills. I want smart hockey players and I want mentally tough guys, good character. And we sacrificed some size for that type of thing. He always said, I can go sign and find guys that can go and be physical and, and hit, but I can't find a kid that competes hard in, hard out every night, a kid that has real good sense and, and, and a good sk skating and, and skill level. And that's kind of, of where I, um, I, I was kind of my, one of my, one of my big changes where I just said, okay. And, and he took the shackles off. It doesn't matter if he's, he's Russian, Latvian, uh, Swedish, Canadian. He said, listen, you guys just drop, you guys go find the best players in the world. And I know out there right now, <clears throat> even now that I'm in Arizona, and, and I think every team talks about it is you, you talk about a, a Latvian kid or a Russian kid, or a, even a Swedish kid, what's their path? How, how are they going to play in the national hockey league? And so we, we, we do talk about that a lot still, but with Steve, it was, ah, we'll worry about that later. Let's get the best players. We'll figure out how to get them and, um, and then sign them and, and develop them. Um, Steve is an interesting guy. He's a workaholic. So you could, you couldn't fool him by pretending to work. He's uh, he'd go to a game and I don't know if he's got a photographic memory, but he remembered all the players and he liked right away. He picked apart all the players. He knew this and that about all the players. And I often thought he's a huge soccer person. So he, his big team is uh, Liverpool. And he's the type of person that if he was going to be a soccer player, if he was born in, in Europe, he'd have been a su superstar at soccer. And instead he was in Canada and he ended up being a hockey player. Uh, huge character guy, ruthless person. So he would fire, fire his best friend if he didn't think he was doing a good enough job. And believe me, I was in the crosshairs. We were winning, winning uh, a lot of games every year. And a lot of times I, it seemed like I was in his crosshairs to, to prove myself again and over and over and over. He'd get mad at the littlest thing. But what you did when you learned from a guy from Steve was every little thing counts. So we had to know everything about every little player, whether it was a, an asthma drug, he was on special medication for, for anything. We had to know all that stuff. And we didn't, we were, we were in big trouble. So that was my, my first, so that was 12 years ago when I um, started with Steve that it got, it got incredibly serious. Like it, it was fun, but man, oh man, you had to work, which, which is good. Um, the second part I want to talk about is, is, is on this, on the front page is, uh, all the players that I showed you that we've been part of staff I've been in, in uh, dealt with all the guys we drafted and some of them, I, I named obviously the best ones, um, but almost every one of those guys, including Victor Hedman and even Kucherov, they had to develop. They, they weren't happy with Hedman the first three or four years. And even you watch Victor Hedman play now, it seems like he keeps getting better and better and better as he gets older. And out of that draft class, which would have been Tavares, uh, Matt Duchesne, a few of those guys, it ended up Victor Hedman's going to be the best one. And it's because, I think it's because he's got an open mindset. Again, those are things we, we still test for. We're trying to figure out if kids have open or closed mindsets. And Victor has an open mindset, which allows him to develop, get better, and, um, and be the leader he is. I mean, he, he might play another five or eight or ten years with this guy, so... But even on there, one of the one of the three guys that I probably or four guys that I've been probably most proud of <clears throat> that we drafted in Tampa was Braden Point, who was a small five foot nine guy that couldn't skate very well. That's why he went in the third round. Anthony Cirelli was a skinny uh, five six foot person who was probably 165, 170 pounds that wasn't close to playing. He was a that year he got drafted, he was a walk-on to his team. 
Andre Palat, we drafted in the seventh round. And the reason we drafted him was because we heard he was going to the camp in Pittsburgh. So we better draft him and, and uh, get him in our system. And Matthew Joseph. So those are those, those players right there were the bulk of the Tampa Bay Lightning. Um, they were the depth. They were the um, nucleus and guts of that team that just won the, won the championship. So those guys all had to develop. And back, back a little bit on Steve Eisman. There's probably four or five or six NHL teams that spend a ridiculous amount of money at development. And now I know the two because one's Tampa and the other one would be Detroit. There's no money that Steve wouldn't spend <laughs> on a player. <laughs> uh, weight rooms, the skills coaches, the skating coaches. He spends an amazing amount of money at that. And now Tampa continues to do that. Um, obviously, Detroit is doing it now. <clears throat> I think Toronto's one. And in Arizona, that's something we're, we're setting up right now, whether it's uh, more skating coaches, more skills coaches, guys that can be on the road with our players. And I find that <clears throat> we can draft these guys and then you need the skills and skating people and probably even the psychologist to spend time with these kids to help develop them. And if you don't do that, four or five years down the road, everybody's getting fired because nobody, nobody drafted very well. Flip side is you can draft good, good to let's say above average. And if you have the right people in, involved in, in your skill development, you got hockey players. And that's what we've, we're trying to do in, in Arizona. Um, changing of the game. <clears throat> Again, when I started, it was all big and strong. Now, um, I think even you're seeing small guys from around the world, whether they're Russian, uh, Swedish, American, Canadian, <clears throat> nobody's passing over the five, nine, five foot, 10 guy that can skate, has skills, uh, will compete and potentially score goals. And now those guys go as a premium. And a lot of, of that has to do with analytics. Analytics has kind of been a, a the last four or five years, been a big push or drive of all these types of players. Um, the problem is that we have is you can only win with a couple of them. They have to be, they have to be stud, mentally and physically. And we, we got lucky with Kucherov, Point, um, those types of players. Before that was Marty St. Louis. And I, I don't think kids understand what, what level these guys go to to be great. And they might take three or four weeks off in the summer, but these guys are religiously in the gym, uh, in the gym, trying to develop their, their power. And, um, you don't have to be big, but you got to be powerful and, and uh, along with your skill and, and, and sense and all that stuff. And that's what um, I know <laughs> defensemen. The last few years, the Stanley Cup champion has been on their defense. They've had usually one person who's six foot or smaller. The rest of everybody's defense is, is quite big, but it's hard for me or <clears throat> scouts to find a bunch of big guys that can skate, pass, think, and uh, compete. So it's an ongoing process. I think personally, the best, if I could find um, McDonough who played with Tampa, a six foot one, six foot player, a 200 pound defenseman who Steve always wanted big hips on the guy, a guy that was, could really skate and uh, be powerful, but, but play a powerful, play against powerful forwards. So, I think that I think going forward, you're going to see probably a little smaller defenseman, the six foot six foot one guy, but he has to be incredibly um, powerful or, or fast or, or competitive. He's got to have something special in his game. But I think you're seeing more and more guys go that way. Um, in Tampa, we um, we looked at again speed and agility, hockey sense skill and a huge component was compete and character. I can't, I can't stress enough uh, of those guys. And <clears throat> you guys are all in development and you know each age group who has the ability 
who's a good kid, who's, who's the average kid, and then who's the bad kid. And I know the last 12 years, and, and starting even with Arizona, if we sniffed out there was a problem with your character, even, it, I mean, there was three or four guys that went in the first round this year that we just took off our list, and we're not willing to try and develop them. It's too hard. There's too much money. Um, if the guy is not dedicated enough and has strong will and character, we cut our ties before we even draft him. And uh, that started with Steve and man, oh man, we saw it. We saw it in, in Tampa with, with those types of guys that they won with or have been winning with is the bread and butter is those guys. So, um, but through the years, I got to tell you, I, uh, I've learned all the way along and I'll, I'll give you a story. I was on an Air Canada flight probably 10 years ago. And on this flight, there was a, you know, every, there's a, a TV in every seat. And I was watching this documentary on uh, moto hockey. And I've looked for it and looked for it for years on, on, on YouTube or, or Googled, Googled it, can never find it. And it was, it was hosted by Anders Hedberg, who was one of the first, uh, first Swedish players to ever come across and play in the National Hockey League. So probably in the 60s, 70s. And it was on moto hockey. And I couldn't, I, it was, I watched it and I was glued to it. And it was in English and it was also in uh, Swedish with subtitles. But it was one of the most interesting things I'd ever seen. And it talked about the, the head guy or the, the, um, the guy that developed moto hockey in the 60s was a guy, a local guy from, from, from the moto area or Sveska, or however you say the, the name of, of the northern part of Sweden. And he went, to, he went to Russia and studied what they were doing with their skill development. And then he brought it back to moto and started developing hockey players. And when you, go, when you walk into their rink in moto, They've got 21 or 22 NHL players that have, are on the wall that have played. And, and these, aren't, these aren't just the, the average hockey player. These are, these are uh, Forsberg, Nylander, Hedman, um, the Sedin twins. Like these, this, this wall was full of superstars. And I got in a big fight in my local. I live in Halifax. I once lived about an hour outside Halifax in a small town with small town ideas and I was doing stuff for free just because I was on the road so much. My wife and I would do stuff for free. And that really pissed some people off. And pretty soon they, were, they wanted to get rid of me because of who I was, but also they were desperate to get rid of my wife who was um, the skating person who, who everybody was starting to go to. So in a funny way, money was driving all these guys to get rid of my wife because <clears throat> we were doing it too cheap or for free or and the money wasn't flowing the right way. So I, I got up in, in, in the room and I talked about at the time McKinnon hadn't made the national hockey league. So I said to the person, uh, this group of people, I said, listen, we have dealt developed three hockey players that have been drafted in the national hockey league in the last five years. And I think um, McKinnon was, he wasn't in the national hockey league at that time, but he was, he just got drafted. I said, the last five years, the Hockey Association in California has, de has developed 21 or have gotten drafted. I said, moto hockey. So I then I gave him the story about moto hockey. And I said, how big do you think uh, the town where moto hockey is out of? Nobody knew. 30,000 people. So they're producing 21 in the last 30 years. They produced 21 NHLers. And that did include the people playing in the KHL, the Swedish Elite League, all the European leagues around the world. And us, in our little town, was probably 30 to 50,000 people in that area. We produced none. And so I often thought, like, how can that be where a place like Moto and a place like, and that's, this, that's what Anders Hedberg talked about, development, the kids on the ice, the skating platforms, the skills platforms, and at the very end, he goes, it has nothing to do with genetics. And I thought, thank God he said that because it's so true. It doesn't, you can be small, big, powerful. Uh, Pedersen in Vancouver is skinny and weak. 
it doesn't matter. Genetically, it doesn't matter. But what matters is what you teach your kids. And it starts, obviously, if you can start with them young, it certainly helps. But even as they get older, uh, they can be like what you saw in Tampa Bay with all those, that, the group of kids that I showed you. They got developed later and they kept developing. And that's why they're champions. And developing, here's what, I'll tell you another story to, to set up what I'm gonna talk about next. Is, so we moved into Halifax. My wife was, is a, was a skating figure skater. She had got involved with our kids because I have three boys are all in hockey. And so she, would get, she got involved in, in hockey. And then we moved into Halifax and we decided our boys needed to go to, there's a hockey academy called the Maritime Hockey Academy. And Nathan McKinnon has just graduated out of it. I decided to put my sons in there, volunteered my wife. And what happened over the next two or three years was she got a chance three times a week for two hours of those three, of those three days to figure out how figure skating and, uh, and your edges and all that stuff can, can relate to hockey. So our, our first year there, she had four kids drafted, drafted in the, in the Quebec major, all in the first round. And then she just kept developing people, developing people. And now this past year, she had seven kids drafted in the National Hockey League in, in our area that all come to her. And, and most of them she's had since they've been little boys. So it's kind of started what we were doing. And I know it's probably what Toby does now is <clears throat> it kind of the light bulb went off and we were going, man, oh man, if we can get to these kids at a younger age and teach them their skating platform, what an advantage for these kids. And so we do our skating. I rent, I was on eight hours to, or four hours today already this morning. And we've gotten down to one hour Kids are only on an hour and we used to do it an hour and a half ice time and we do 30 minutes of skating at one end, 30 minutes of skill at the other and we'd flip and always, always, always the last 20, 25 minutes of every, of every practice when I had an hour and a half of ice was all small area games. And we saw, we saw such an improvement with that formula. Um, our kids loved it. They, they can only take about a half, 20 to 30 minutes of skating, whether you're a, a six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, your attention span is probably too, too small to go an hour. And as you get bigger and older and, and heavier, physically, you can probably only handle 20 to 30 minutes of skating. And then we would switch, do the skilled part of, of our, our program. And then I loved, and I'll never, ever go away from this, the 20 minutes, 25 minutes of, of small area shinny. And the kids love it. You can sit there with young kids and you can blow the whistle and you can talk about the Royal Road. You can talk about um, uh, triangulation. You can talk about support. You can talk about changing lanes. And I've taken groups on the Monday that it's a, it's a total train wreck, uh, the, the, the little shinny games. By Wednesday, I've got them kind of thinking the game better. I've got them trusting what we're working on skill wise. And by Friday, the parents can't believe they're actually watching their kid play because they're, they're touch passing, they're changing lanes, they're one-timing pucks, um, having fun. And, and that was the biggest thing out of all this was um, how much fun the kids can have. And we've got kids in, in Halifax, and I would think it's all across North America and maybe it's in Latvia and in different places and in in other places in the world. We've got kids that'll be on the ice four or five hours a day. And they will come, they'll be on in the morning. They come in their skate guards. They jump on the ice with us for an hour. The parents shove them a sub and they put their skates guards all back on and away they go. And I don't know if one of those kids has developed. I, I don't know if one of those kids has developed and, and we got a whole crew of them. Everybody's trying to get their 10,000 hours of development in so that they become a star. And <clears throat> the last two years, we've changed our development a little bit. Part of it is because of COVID. 
that we couldn't get all our kids on the ice as much as we wanted to. So we went to one hour, three times a week. And I think it's even a better model because as the kids get older um, and they start training, our kids, especially our older kids that are in uh, juniors and pro, they get, to, they get to work out in the morning from whatever, eight, about two hours, two and a half hours in the morning, and then they'll come to us for an hour. And I think guys get burnt out with too much. And I, I don't know what you guys think about all that, but I think kids can get burnt out. And um, I think it stunts their development. I really do. So, so we've kind of changed our model the last two years where we're just doing um, training, um, skating and skills. And I think when you, and I think you guys, people in Latvia, Sweden, Finland, Russia, I think you guys are still more multi-sport athletes. In Canada and the US, I think kids get too streamlined too early and they start, um, they, they, don't have, they don't have skills. They don't have uh, body motion. They don't have, they don't have good athleticism. And it's a huge problem that we're, what we're seeing now is these kids, these kids will make these teams. The parents want to do a fundraiser. They can't ride a bicycle. They can't ride a bicycle. So they can't, they can't do a fundraiser where they're raising money for that. So we've got kids that can't ride a bike, but are on uh, 25 hours of ice a week. And it, it, to me, it, they're re and I know I'm watching them re regress and um, burnt out very little character, no feeling for the game. And I look in their eyes and they just seem to be lost. So if I could, if I could do one thing, uh, advise people of one thing, multi-train your athletes, um, limit how much ice they are, are on. Don't play as many games in the summer, especially this summer. I, I think it's, if you can play small area games, Kids love it. They'll burn themselves out. They'll they'll blow out their they'll 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 compete until the, they drop dead. Skating and skills, and skating skills I I can do. Most of you guys can do. The part of the problem is the skating part, and I can tell when I'm watching a hockey game. I know when a kid's not a good skater. I know when a kid's on our, the ice with us, if he's not a good skater. I know some of the things how to change it and can you know talk about certain of the things, but until I, I got my wife involved, um, I don't even try anymore. <clears throat> I don't try and give advice on stuff because I know I don't have, I don't have the same feeling she does. I don't have the same knowledge and I can't correct. Um, the most kids we take, we are, we like 16 kids on the ice. We divide them up into eight groups of eight, two groups of eight. And then the, even the smaller, the better. Um, just because you can spend more reps and you can do more correction. I, I, when we watch other people do their stuff, they get more, more kids on the ice. So obviously they make money. They run the kids through and no correction. And I think that's the biggest disappointment when I see different camps or I go to a different part of the world and I'm watching uh, the, the Finns practice. And if I see that, that part disappoints me because I, I think these kids, if they're good kids and they're, they got an open mindset, they, they can learn and they, they can develop and they can change. And the biggest thing is getting kids to change. And when I first went to, when I first went to work with Steve, we had our, our scouting meetings in January. I took my wife, and we're sitting there and she asked Steve, are you born with it or can you develop it or grow it? And he thought about it and thought about it. And he goes, I think you're born with it. And I've thought about that for years. And I kind of agree with what Steve, I think some kids are born with it. I think Sidney Crosby, uh, Nathan McKinnon, kids around the world that are stars, they were gonna be stars anyway. And I think all you guys know when you're running a, a camp, let's say there's 10 kids on the ice. You know, there's two kids that are 
that are hanging on every word you say. You know, there's probably three kids that don't even want to be there, that um, they're looking at the stands of their dads. And then the rest of the kids, I think they're on the fence. And I think if you do a good job with the skating, make skating fun, because skating, skating isn't always fun. If you can make your skill development fun, and then it comes back to having a small area games. And kids, kids love games. Our pro group of, of, of all our pros, they love games. I just think it's, if, you can, if you can do those three things, I think you have a chance to pull the kids that are on the fence into um, a competitive situation and, and develop them. I, I think that's a key to development is grabbing these kids, um, making it fun, making it, um, making it easy on them. And I, I watched the Russians, I watched the Russians play. I don't know if it's like that in Latvia or not. You watch a kid go back to the bench and man, oh man, is he in trouble. And I think it happens in everywhere, but the Russians seem to, when they come back to the bench, some of those kids I think are scared shitless to come back to the bench. And I just, I don't think it should be like that. I think you can get mad at the kids and you can, um, you can be firm with them. And there's sometimes you're, you know, I mean, even myself with my own kids, I'm ready to come unglued. But I think it's, if you can settle down and talk to them, I think it helps with development. And um, those are the things I, I look at. Um, I also, I, I also steal a lot of drills, <laughs> whether it's Toby, my wife puts everything on, she puts it, some of the stuff on Instagram and something stuff on, uh, on different outlets, but I follow, I follow on Instagram, RHA hockey out of, he's a Russian guy. I think he goes back between Russia and, and uh, Toronto. I call, I follow a guy named, uh, Magnus Helene out of Sweden. He's EM, EMH skill drill. I follow Alex Antropov out of Russia. And he comes back and forth. I think he's in and out of North America and Russia. I watch uh, KB Dangles out of the USA, out of Detroit. And he's an amazing guy with, with stick handling and, and just different drills that are fun for the kids. I follow, obviously, uh, Overspeed Hockey with Toby. I follow DB Hockey Factory with Daniel Broberg out of, out of um, Sweden, out of Stockholm. Amazing site. He, he shares all his stuff. Um, and then there's two guys, two guys I follow out of Russia that are Canadian guys that are, are skill development guys in, in Russia. And that's Daniel Boucher, Bushner out of, I think, Ska, and Ted Sokokan. And I think he's out of another KHL team. So I follow those guys. I pilfer ideas. I pilfer drills. I arrange them for small ice. And I arrange them for our kids. Um, which I have found over the years to be just outstanding. Um, I, I, obviously, we all, I think we all cheat on that kind of stuff. And I think it's, it's um, I, I applaud the guys that put out all our stuff and say, here, do it, try it. If you guys can do it, good. And that's what kind of we do. I know the, the skating part, my wife puts it all out because she knows nobody else in our area can do it. So she's okay with putting all of this, kind of all the stuff she does uh, her drills and, and what she works on. And, and, um, we have, we have more people that come to us, not because of me, but because of my wife. And, and, uh, so I'm lucky. I have, uh, I have the secret weapon sitting in my, in my house that, uh, people are after. <clears throat> I do the skills and I do, I have the fun with the kids, but she's the one that kind of drives it all. And, and just so you guys know, she, I, I wrote down some of the things that, that she's after and probably what she has to change the most about the kids. And posture is huge. Um, what they do with their hands is next. Ankle flexion. Everybody thinks that the bad skaters, oh, if they just get stronger and bend their knees, they'll be a better skater. But more often than not, it's not your knees, it's that your ankles are too tight. So if you can't bend your ankles, you can't bend your knees. And you can be as strong as a, as a football player, but you can't bend your ankles, it doesn't matter. You can push as much weight as you want. And 
part of the, how we know that kids have tough ankle flexion is if you're going down and you say, okay, not necessarily shoot the duck, but I want everybody to put their, their butt to their heels on their skates. And if they can't do that, and we've got kids that have never been able to do it, we know they probably have tight ankles. And then there's certain kids that can do anything on their blades because they're, you know, they just, they're so flexible on their ankles. So ankle flexion, and I say that to some people, whether they're in the National Hockey League and they start thinking about it and they're like, yeah, that does make sense. I've seen certain players and, and they are strong. And we've, we've, we've been trying to develop them to bend their, bend their knees more. And they go, I've never thought that it would be, my, be their ankles. So if you've got kids that can't do certain things, uh, Braden Point was that. Braden Point wasn't a very good hockey, uh, a very good skater. So we got him in the third round. And Barb Underhill, who's a Tampa skating coach, would spend probably, she'd probably go to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan twice a year, twice a month to work on his ankle flexion. And I said, Barb, how, how hard is it to, to change? She goes, one of the hardest things for a skater to do, bigger skater or, or hockey player, is, is to get better ankle flexion. And she said, Braden Point worked on it every day, religiously, to become a better skater. And she says, he's, she, he's one of so many percent that changed just because of, of pure will and desire <clears throat> to be the best. And, and um and he did it. He's just like amazing. And <clears throat> the other thing too is um, she works on a credible amount of edge work and your head, which ends up being your posture, your eyes. Um, and that's the biggest thing when I'm doing stuff. If the kids have been trained to look at the puck head down, usually their posture's off. If they've been trained to keep their head up, I, 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 I say, listen, guys, if, if you're chase a puck in the corner and you put your head down, you're a checker. That's all you can be. If you put, keep your head up and are know where everybody is, um, all 10 players on the ice, you're not usually not a checker. So that's what we've been, that's another thing that we've always kind of pounded on is posture, hands, um, your head and eyes and little things like that. And, and I could make a, I could quit hockey today quit my job, go full-time into development. And I get the kids at eight, nine, 10. I'm telling them all the same out of hundred kids. I have to change 99. <clears throat> and that's for me, that's a sad, sad thing. I, I think in Canada, we waste so many guys. We, we teach, we teach a lot of crappy stuff to these kids. And then we try to, as you get older, it takes more money and more time to unwind all the crap that they've been taught all the way up. And that's why when we get kids, we've got a, we had an 03 group that was we just got seven group kids drafted in the National Hockey League. We've got an 06 group coming through Halifax that my wife's had for the last four or five years. And I think they're, they're the next big kind of group coming through our area. And she's just had them since they were little boys. And um, I think they're gonna be great, so. So, so far, I, um, I know I've talked about a lot of stuff. I know I've talked about a lot of experiences. I just wanted to let you know that nationwide, I think out of all the nations, the Finns do the best job. I think they've got um, eight or nine million people in the country. They produce every year a, a lot of draft picks and they produce a lot of NHL players. And I think it's because they spend a lot of money and time on skating skills. They let the kids play. They let the kids, um, I think they've gone to a smaller ice surface, kind of a hybrid ice surface in Finland. And I think it's helped. One of the biggest things I'm, I, I, I despise of all these skills coaches, not skills coaches, hockey coaches, is in Canada, we have taught the cycle. You come up the boards and you throw the puck, you throw the puck in the corner to cycle. And I'm that's one of the areas I'm trying to unwind. I'm like, guys, come up the boards, try and make a play, try and make a pass, try and skate through a lane. The last thing I want you to see you do is throw the puck down low 
and, and cycle it. And <clears throat> I spend hours and hours and hours a, a week talking about this to kids. Get, get away from cycling the puck. And I'm like, you guys will come up. Here's a normal shift. You cycle, 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 back check. I said, that's all I ever see you guys do. I want to see you guys come up the boards, make a play to the defenseman, make a play across ice, make a play down low, a give and go. The last thing I should see you do is cycle. And I think that's really killed hockey in Canada. And we have all these robots. And the most impressive thing about Finnish hockey, um, even Swedish hockey, Russian hockey, and even I think the U.S. has gotten away from, from that type of hockey that is, is in Canada. We're stuck with a lot of older coaches with old ideas. And I think they're stuck in their way. And there's certain areas of the, of the, of the country that are starting to uh, thaw. I think for the longest time, the, the Europeans were ahead of, of North American skill development. I think the last 15 years, the U.S. has poured a lot of money into skill development. And I think in the last 10 years, Canada's seen like, okay, we can't hit kids. We can't punch kids. We can't intimidate kids. So now actually we have to start scoring goals and, and, and competing that way. So you're seeing it in Toronto, Calgary, Edmonton. You're seeing where um, hockey academies are starting. Skill development, every rink now in Canada, every hour in a lot of places has got skilled coaches. And I think that's the direction. I think Canada's catching up. I hope they're catching up uh, with nations that are in, in Europe as far as skill development. Problem in Canada, and I'm sure it's a problem in your country, is the cost. And um, that's the sad part about hockey is it's so expensive to play, <clears throat> so expensive for equipment, and expensive for ice and I hate to say that I, 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 I think we make money at what we do. We don't gouge. We, uh, we charge $30 an hour Canadian, which is probably 25 American. Uh, we have kids that come for free because I know they're from, from um, families that can't afford it, whether they're divorced families. So we don't, we make money at this. I do it as a hobby. I do it. Uh, my wife, doesn't do it as a hobby, but um, it's never been, it's never been for us. It's never been a, a money-making uh, type of thing for us. And uh, I know I could make a lot more money at it, but it'd take a lot more time. And, and um, yeah, I know I've, I've, uh, I got one more story for you and it was on St. Louis blues. The year they won the cup two years ago, they fired their coach at Christmas time. They were in last spot in January. They brought in an old, crusty, tough guy named Craig Berube. And I listened to him on, on a radio show. He talked about his team out of shape and no skill. And the guy says, well, how did you change that? He goes, we played three on three. He goes, I made the guys after practice, at the end of practice, play three on three. He goes, it helped. It helped our conditioning immensely. And he said, it helped our skill level. And I heard that and I'm like, thank God, because I, that's, that's, again, our last 10, 15, 20 minutes is always games. And I really do believe it helps your conditioning. And if you got a, an instructor there that will blow the whistle every once in a while, talk to the kids about the Royal Road, talk to the kids about certain things, their skill development and, and even, even their um, hockey IQ can be developed. And, and I'm a, I'm a huge believer in that now. I, um, I've been doing this, I'm, I'm 53 years old. I've been playing since I've been three. I've been doing what the skating or the, the coaching and, and scouting for the last 30 years. I've been doing skill development probably for the last, because of my kids, the last eight, nine years. Steve asked me what I do when I go home. I said, Steve, my kids aren't on the ice. I jump on the ice with my wife and it's therapeutic. It's what I love. I love to help kids. I love to work on their one-timers. I love to just make them better hockey players. And I said, I do it for free. I mean, I go out there and I do it for free just because I just, I love it. It's what I've always done. It's I've been on the ice since I've been three 
and uh, I'm getting old and, and fat and, and uh, but it's still fun to go out with kids and, and look in their eyes and, and make sure they have fun. So I, um, it's been a journey. I don't know how much longer I'll do this, probably five or six years. My kids, my youngest is uh, 16. So we've been doing this mainly because our kids are going, are going through, but now that we've got kind of a business going, I'll, I'll probably do it for a few more years. And, and, um, and it's been a lot of fun. It's been a journey. I've learned a lot by so many people around the world, whether I go to into Finland and go and watch a hockey practice, Sweden, it's been, um, it's been a real good journey. So the last thing I'll talk about is we've invited Henri Ravinskis to our camp. I hope you guys all know who he is. We watched him uh, play for Latvia at the under 18s. His best game was against Canada. I think he had two goals maybe that game. Anyway, he was, uh, we were going to draft him. So if anybody knows him, tell him. I know he's coming to our camp in, in Arizona here in the next month. We were going to draft him. And then um, just like what I said with Andre Palat, we did our, our homework, see how many people were actually super interested in in, in him. And we found, figured that there wasn't that many people interested in him or that high on him. So we took the chance and let him slide through the draft. And he was our first call to bring him to camp. So I don't know if anybody in the, in the call knows him, but um, he's a good hockey player. He's going to play in uh, Blainville in the CHL this year. And uh, we're excited to have him. Is there any questions? Uh, Dale, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, um, they're going to go around. They've got a portable microphone. Um, okay. Guys, if you do have any questions about any of that, you know, the Steve Eisman, uh, you know, I've heard so much about Steve Eisman in, uh, over the years and things like that. Um, I remember Dowell, he probably even forgets it. We were in uh, the Calgary Marriott and it was just the two of us somehow. Um, I don't think we had a game that night and we just started talking. They have a double, double deck um, concierge on. I think we sat there for three, three and a half hours just talking about skating and skill development. Because like Dalla, when I was working in the National Hockey League, I did this as therapy. And I did this because I thought things weren't being done the right way. And I, I did this because, well, it was fun. And we were helping kids. Um, and we just talked. And uh, it was great. And I kind of stayed connected with him from there. So like he said, he doesn't have to do this now. It's because he loves doing it. the same thing we talked about. So, so please, like, I don't think anyone out there is better than Steve Eisenman. Uh, one as a player, one as Captain Canada, one as uh, the architect, really, behind what you guys did down there. I take nothing away from what your staff did, obviously, Dowell. But um, he's going to do it again in Detroit. I, I, he's going to do it again in Detroit. So. If you guys have any questions, Oleg's obviously he played for you. Uh, the under 18 coaches here also, uh, Dallas. So um, okay. there's, there's a microphone. I'm going to turn it over to them. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yep. So uh, actually, yeah, thanks for Henri. And uh, I hope he, he does good there. Uh, he's, he's a very interesting guy. And you will definitely have to, like, get his skating skill level but uh, on the other hand it's so so his skating is so weird that it helps him to go through some interesting situations so i don't know what you'll decide but that will be interesting to see and i i agree with you that was kind of at the end like ah he's you know his skating is okay and but it, it, you know it, we thought he played really well we noticed him and skating, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys some of you guys will know these names: Liam O'Brien, who we just signed in Arizona; Morgan Barron, who played with the Rangers this, this year; Drake Batherson, who played with um, Ottawa; Igor Sokolov is a Russian kid who's been over here. He's gonna play. He played in um, Bellevue. He'll probably play with Ottawa this year. Noah Dobson, who plays with the Islanders, and Ryan Graves, who now plays with New Jersey. All those kids come to my wife. All of them were average skaters or below average. And like Drake Batherson, all those kids, I, I mean, every one of those kids has had to, they came to my wife at 17, 18, and they had to change a lot of things. <clears throat> so there it comes down to that open mindset and they were willing to put in the time and energy. And um, 
that that's where for me I, I know for for her that's where she she gets the most satisfaction of, of those guys that she can make into uh, you know they, they're making millions of dollars some of these guys so <clears throat> that's her satisfaction is, is developing that part and i and i Henri, I, I will get him to camp and um see what he can do and, and um yeah I, I agree his skating probably need, does need to that's probably what's going to hold him back a little bit yeah but he's a he's a, he's very straight up fast skater like right away so so hopefully you can use it and he was a kind of a mr goal for us during the season because he can find those pucks in front of the net yeah. and, and stuff like that. So that's one thing. But I, the question I wanted to ask you about the uh, kids, about the uh, age of kids, that what what your wife would would say maybe or what you would say about the uh, how 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 big can be that change in skating at at certain age and what would be that age. Uh, where where you can like still work well, on that, really like like honestly because I understand like one thing that you told me told us <laughs> that uh, this player still has to understand hockey and 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 be willing to do that for sure and be <clears throat> having a character for that. If you can get a hold of them, right? My my three boys can really skate, and now they're very you know varying. One, my, my one boy got drafted this year by Detroit. They're, he's probably going to be the best one. They can all skate. If you can get them at a young age, the better. Like they're, they're, You've got to set up their platform, their ability to their return, their, 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 um, their posture, the, the, the way they use their hands, all that stuff. Muscle memory, if you can get them right at the beginning, uh, five, six, seven, eight, they, away they go. And um, I, I laugh because the kids that I've talked about, some of these guys, they're the best, they're the biggest kids growing up. They're the best, they score the most goals. They, they don't come to my wife. They don't think they got a problem. Their dad, mom and dad think they're going to be great players. All of a sudden they hit 16, 17 into junior and they can't play. So they come roaring back. They all enroll in my wife's skate and now she's got to rebuild them. And some can crawl out of it, and some, some they just you not they they just it's too far gone. The muscle memory they they're just too far gone. So <clears throat> the younger you can get a hold of these kids, and hopefully the parents are smart enough, and when their kids are already one of the better players, is to keep pounding the skating part. Thanks. Anybody? <clears throat> anybody else? Questions regarding players? Different countries, anything. I'd love to go work with your wife some summer. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else yeah. have anything? Any of the coaches have anything? No. Oh. Dell, um, we can't thank you enough. You know, I know it's a little bit of a downtime now, but you know, after the World Juniors uh, camps and the Halinka and things like that, um, it gets kind of busy here, so. Um, you know, uh, I hope you understand why I asked you and I think you, uh, you kind of covered everything I was hoping. Um, I'm a big believer in what Jill talks about as well as you know, and her and I have talked many yeah. times. I'm not into the fancy stuff. I mean, we're, we are into the basics, you know, the balance, um, uh, the posture, um, you know, uh, the ankle flexion. We do ankle flexion. We did ankle flexion almost all day today, you know, yeah. um, so important shin shin angle things like that that Matt Bertani talks about. So it's all about basic things, and, and you're so right. And and seeing it and working in it daily, being able to be out on the ice with the kids in the summers back when I was on the road a ton, it made all the difference. I saw things differently as I traveled the world, you know. So um, I know you're busy, and please know how much I and our whole group, but obviously the guys here and. We have about 35 coaches from around Latvia online listening as well. So we can't thank you enough. Can I have one more yeah, and but I mean, I've dealt with this stuff for a long time. <clears throat> as coaches, I, I would tell coaches, and I got in a lot of trouble. I mean, my kids got abused because maybe who I was, who I was. But if I can give coaches one advice, bit of advice, it's have an open mindset. Um, because you guys, you guys make a difference. And I, I told that to a couple of coaches that were 
pounding on kids and, and beating up my guys. And, and I tried to, I tried to settle it all down by saying, listen, you kids look up to their teachers. They look up to their parents and they look up to their coaches. And if you can be, if you can teach them and help them and develop them, um, that's to me, that's what it's all about. There is one more question, Daryl. I, okay. I was also wondering, um, you know, about the uniqueness of the player and also like we talk about uh, low, low, uh, sitting low and so on, so on and so on. But you know, like there are some players who might not need that because of the way they, I don't know, the way they play, the way they, I don't know, score or something. Even, even if we look at uh, probably Con Conor McDavid, let's say, yeah. yeah, I would say he is pretty straight, like kind of a guy when he skates in when you skate around, like it's kind of a couple steps one side, the other side, and and it's definitely not a big bend in his legs, but he's accelerating so good. So, how much you look at that as a scout and stuff like that, something that is unique in a player and maybe should not be changed. One thing he does, and I, again, so my wife, he crosses his feet really well. He uses his edges and he crosses his feet. And <clears throat> I watched the Swedish players play, their ability to cross their feet, whether it's going around a circle, whether it's um, exploding up one way, and then Connor McDavid ex uses his edges and, and it crosses his feet so well. Um, what's the guy in, um, the guy with the Islanders, the real good skater in the Islanders? That's what he does. Like, holy Christ, That's he comes up. Barzell, he comes up the ice and it's not just straight, it's their ability to generate power as they're crossing their feet. And it's, you watch that kind of stuff and you're like, wow, it looks like they're, they're wasting energy and wasting direction. But as they come on up, they're, they're so elite that way that um, you're right. It's not, and that's where the Swedes, the Swedish skaters, I mean, their ability to go backwards and cross their feet, they're, they've been taught to cross their feet. Um, I just think it's a big advantage of once I what, let's put it the other way. If the kid can't cross his feet, he's going into to anywhere. And I know he's got to go to a different direction and he can't cross his feet. I know he's in big trouble. I know he's in big trouble. And how much, and how much you as a scout look at this uniqueness? Like, you know, uh, I look at it a lot. Uh, the NHL has gotten so big, so fast. Um, even in a lot, I think it, it's, it changes gears about every five years. The guys are so talented as far as their ability to, to skate. And <clears throat> we look at players and if, if we think we can improve his skating, we still are, we still are interested. If, if it's a flaw, we like, I don't know if he can improve his skating. We, we back off. And there are some kids that prove us wrong. You know, they, they develop. Uh, we didn't think they could skate well enough. We're, you know, we're, we're on, but I know we separate players by, by if, they, if we don't think they can skate or are going to be able to skate at a certain level, we back off. And then, one then one more about Braden Point. Point. Uh, he's he's fake. fake. Did he, Did he have it? it? Or he, or he, just, he developed it during the dump? He, the only thing, Braden Point, we went in to watch Morgan Riley Morgan's draft year. This is seven, eight years ago. There was a smallest little guy on the ice right out of Bantam hockey. He was a 15 year old. They brought him up to play in Moose Jaw. He was one of the best players on the ice. His hockey sense, um, you look, you, you know, I mean, at that age, he would have been five, five foot seven, 130 pounds, maybe lighter. And you wonder how a guy at that size is going to survive because he went into the playoffs. And the team they were playing, I can't remember, were trying to kill him, and they couldn't hit him. So his hockey sense, hockey IQ, and skill level, for me, are off the charts. We were never crazy about his size, but it was what the reason he went in the third round is his skating wasn't great. He wasn't a great skater. That's the only reason. Otherwise, I mean, you go back in that draft, he's probably a, a top five pick. You know, they stole Braden. We stole Braden Point that year. And uh, you know what? A lot of lot, some some staffs in the National Hockey League lost their jobs over it, and um, they're like, "How can this guy slide to the third round?" Well, us included. If we th thought he was going to be better, we'd have taken him earlier. So we stumbled. We kind of stumbled on 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 Braden Point.
But part of it was Steve Eisman let us take smaller players. Some teams won't take a smaller player. So we were lucky. That will, uh, just to close it up, uh, in, in 60 seconds, uh, Tyler Johnson, another smaller player with a unique, a unique story in Spokane because he lives in the same household as, as a pretty good teacher. And then you look at somebody like Kayla y Yamamoto in uh, Edmonton, yep. and Ella undersized happens to live in the same town. If you could just talk about that and then we'll close up. Well, and there was um, Spurgeon was on that same team. Yeah, Spurgeon, go up. Yep. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know if you were with the Islanders when they drafted him, but they didn't sign him. So all those guys, Johnson and Spurgeon, were pretty much free agents, and they're both stars. Um, Tyler Johnson's skating is was off the charts. Like he slowed down a little bit, but skating and and toughness. You know, it's just when you're small, you're going to get your butt kicked a lot of times. And um, to me, it, it comes down to skating and character with him and his skill. Like that year we went to the finals against Chicago, he led us in scoring. It's just their ability, it's desire, it's pure desire. When you're that small, nothing, those guys, nothing stands in their way. So that's, that's what makes those guys, even Spurgeon, Yakamoto, all, all those guys, they're just nothing standing in their way. Yeah, we were there when we drafted them and we were there when they didn't sign them and that was a big argument so um yes. kind of kind of happy seeing what he uh what he's done now so um again thanks for doing what you do back there you've helped a ton of kids same with jill um wish you her the kids nothing but good luck and thank you so much for being with us thanks for having me and uh, i'd gladly come on anytime and talk hockey guys anytime thanks, Darryl. thank you guys well All right, I'm gonna try and bring Chris on here. Oh, Schwartzy, there you are. I'm here. All right, I'm gonna make you co-host now. So Ready? you can sc screen share and everything else like that. Can't yet. It's host disabled. I'm gonna make you Should be on now. It's indicating you're on. All right. Yep, you're good, Chris. Um, yes, Chris and, and I'm just I'm just going to quickly introduce you. Also, um, one thank you for being here. Um, some of the guys that were on the call in March. Uh, remember, Chris kind of talked about a 5,000 foot uh, view down on, on fitness, strength and conditioning uh, within the game. Um, Chris is the uh, strength coach for uh, Ottawa in the National Hockey League, came up through the Ontario Hockey League, uh, worked with Matt and I in New York. Matt and he lived together when New York started a summer development program for some of their players. And Chris did the fitness portion, Matt did the skill development portion. Um, and they've remained friends. So um, we thank Chris a ton. He owns a company called FitQuest, which is where a lot of his energies and, and future vision is going a little bit like Darrell. We like this stuff. You know, National Hockey League is really cool. Right? And I'm sure you love getting there. But there's something about this now. We talked about it today, Oscar, you know, like coaching the kids and, and making a difference in young people and, and players on their way up is phenomenal. And, you know, Chris is, Chris is looking at that right now himself. So um, taking the time to be here, he has done a lot of programs with Hockey Canada. He's a featured speaker with them. And again, like Dallas said, trying to get people to see the same thing in a new way. So we just asked him to kind of tie in with what Chad's doing out there and break things into groups so that the kids can experience it out there, but also hockey performance programming just talking about how you can implement something that actually gives the kids a benefit in a local organization with or without a whole lot of resources. So Chris, we can't thank you enough for taking time. I know guys are getting busy both in Ottawa and in, in with FitQuest, other folks that you do. And 
you're going to do this. And he's also volunteered to talk about women's development um, uh, with the women's program this weekend. So um, without anything further, Chris, it's your show, man. Thank you. Thanks for that kind word. Um, thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, as you said, things are ramping up here for us as well. Everybody's getting prepared. And I think it's talking to that, uh, Toby, it's the most fun is sending actually the young athletes off that have, have a world of difference, but also <clears throat> the idea that they're excited about going and playing and they're going there with confidence. You know, I think confidence is one of the biggest things that, uh, that we can instill in them. So what I wanted to do today was review key performance and development indicators. Um, just some things, you know, not specifics, because I think all of you have different teams, you have different cohorts of different needs. And I wanted to just put some thoughts out there to really make, like to me, the whole concept of sports performance is thinking. And again, pulling yourself out, looking from that, that view that's from up above, rather than being doing what, what we do in these compartmentalized areas and don't really think about you know what is it that I have and and no bias and just try to open your mind and 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 have that growth mindset and also discuss some individual concepts um you know there's my my bio I've been doing this over 30 years I was also a performer professional athlete um I wanted to touch again I know some of you who were on the call before in uh, March saw this just to go back to this to understanding that as we move through this continuum, it is vital importance that we remain athletic. My guys, the guys that I have that are the top tier, I could split the two of them up, play some form of game they've never played before, and they're, they're the best athletes and the ones that be able to critically think, move and are athletic. So you're going to hear me touch upon this over and over again, that the concepts of sports performance, but we're always coming back to understanding that they're the best athletes. Um, the understanding that athleticism needs to be the basis of this athletic of, of what we're doing. So the triangle on the pyramid on the left, that's where people like me excel because all we do is take the, we're getting the best horses, they're athletic, they understand the game, they know how to play the game, they have skill acquisition. And then what we do is we apply the sports performance, we get them stronger, we get them faster, we get them better condition, we work on their health. But without that pyramid working like this, it's really, really hard to take an athlete to the next level. Um, just a quick idea of, you know, what should be happening of movement skills. This has all been flipped on its head. Um, apologize if the slide is blurry. Um, but this, this has been flipped on its head because we think that youth to be doing something that a college player is doing or a high school player is doing something that a professional athlete should be doing. So we move these continuums of what we should be doing at a certain age. We just try to fast forward them. Um, as uh, Daryl was saying about, you know, how the question about what Connor McDavid does, that's great what Connor McDavid does, but he wasn't doing that when he was younger. He was building the fundamentals of what he needed to do. And that's why he excels because he can cross over and do those things in different positions. But we don't want to fast forward through this. Daryl talked a little bit too about the evolution of the game and that's constantly in our minds of sports performance. The game is getting so much faster. We've got, we've got cats playing now, you know, we, we got to make sure that we're thinking like we got people that are, they want to outskill the other guy, not outwork them, outskill them. I mean, we want, they want to process and think critically. They they're understanding how to move with the puck without the puck. There's a basis of stabilizing and the game, you know, I've been in the, in the league for 15 years and the game is just totally gone in another way. And we had to adjust to that to say, okay, what type of athlete is walking through the door? Each one of you has, a, has an idea of what kind of athletes are walking through the door. What does the game do at the highest level? And how do I move them along that continuum? Um, I showed this again, because I think it's a, a critical point of people always, some people come to me and say, well, what would you do? And I said, well, let's look at this continuum or let's look at these circles and what does the athlete or your group as a whole need? And that's what we need to implement into, you know, you got a couple hours a week of strength and conditioning, where, what buckets are empty and what buckets are you going to fill? If you think of those as buckets of water, what, where's the area, you know, was your team always injured? 
you know, do you just lack in, you know, skate speed, you're not fast enough, what kind of things can you do in the continuum of what makes a great hockey player, um, you know, did not battle properly. These things all break down into further levels. That could be a whole other talk for some other time when we can actually talk about specifics of that. Um, but however, Chad's going to go through some of these. So, so one, one vital thing is, let's go back to that athleticism. You're going to have athletes, and I generally can put them in this four continuum of really athletic athletes. They're able to move in all directions, versatile to play all sports. They achieve ranges of motion, so I would put mobility into this. To achieve uh, to achieve injury prevention, you know, do they move explosively? Do they move explosively? Can they jump far? Can they start with power? Can they explode into an opponent? You know, generally they fit into one or a couple of these things. You know, are they able to stay low? You know, we talked about that specifically to join angles. What kind of posture they use? Are they able to? stabilize and battle through somebody um, for specific conditioning can they achieve full shifts at the intensity that is required can they practice at the intensity that's required so typically an athlete falls into you know the kid that's really conditioned well conditioned but maybe doesn't have that explode and it's not stable but it's athletic or they're strong and stable and they've been filling the bucket of strong and stable for a while but they have nothing in explode or athleticism or their conditioning doesn't fit into that model right you can probably all think of any kind of players you have on your teams and or you train or you've coached in the past and you could probably put them into one oh this kid was so fast but wasn't strong enough okay well that's where he needs to maybe focus maybe the maybe the workouts are focused a little bit more for him on that the first the, you know this is a really smart very intelligent uh, strength and conditioning coach at the United States uh, named Vern Gambada. And, you know, athletic development is not about, it's not something we do to the athlete and it's something we do with the athlete. These athletes are getting so smart. Um, they've got access to a lot of the same information as we do. And we need to make sure every time that we put in check, are we doing something with the athlete or are we doing it to them? Um, as we kind of scroll through you, 11 to uh, U13, we decided um, that one of the things that we wanted to do was kind of give you an idea of, you know, that big component of athleticism to me is still a big portion of it, along with agility and speed, strength, uh, stability, strength, general conditioning, and general nutrition. So if we, if we look at the individual areas, you know, think to yourself, and you can answer, you can answer these questions for yourself or pose these questions to yourself for each age group and kind of say, okay, what is it that we want our group to do? You know, does the athlete have the ability to move and perform basic tasks? It, you know, scroll down to agility and speed. Is the athlete in an environment that actually promotes agility and speed? Or, you know, we want it, we want them to get faster, but they're never promoting that. They're not in a position to be able to do that. Um, for strength and stability, uh, is the athlete able to stabilize and decelerate with minor tasks, able to get up, you know, get in and hold optimal angles? Uh, general conditioning is the athlete general conditioning hindering his ability to perform in games and practices. Uh, general nutrition, you know, does the athlete under and the parent themselves, and that's one big thing for this age group is we need to make sure the parents are bought in um, to what general nutrition and health is. If we don't have that as a platform, it's really hard later on when we start to individualize. We get through to U14 and U16. Um, again, this is stuff that Chad is gonna go over a little bit. He's gonna take some components of this and talk about what we really mean about athleticism, speed impulse, strength and stability. Um, these are again, the continuum. What we start to add on is some functional power. Doing things with 11, 11 to 13 year olds is great. You know, I have a young baseball player and he's been throwing hard um, for years and people told me don't, you know, he's gonna hurt his arm. It's how you do it. Um, and it's how you step through that continuum for the ma how mature the athlete is. So you gotta make sure when you're doing that and you're looking at these different athletes that so you've, you know, you got some 14 year olds that could look like they're 16 year olds. Maybe they're going faster through the continuum 
but that doesn't mean that you fast forward through that and just jump to what a, a 19 year old will do. Um, does the athlete have the ability to perform and critically think through athletic tasks? So again, we start to add this aspect. Can they critically think? Um, have they lost any athleticism when they were 10 to 13 years old? I can't tell you how many times people just fast forward and then they don't look back and go, okay, these kids are faster. They've got more speed, they're stronger, but they've lost that athleticism. They used to be able to do a somersault and move and move in a different direction. They spend so much time in the weight room now they're, they're not moving. So let's make sure we step back and we look sometimes, are they still as athletic as they were when they were 13 years old? Um, we've seen dips in speed, uh, 40s, 20s, 10s, uh, sprint speed from after the age of 13 because they get in the weight room, they love the weight room, they want to get bigger and stronger, but their speed goes down and that's, that's not good. Um, does, the, does the actual athlete understand how to move with speed? So often you'll see athletes, um, one of the things, you know, working with Eric Carlson is that ability to go from A to B and go forward and not take a step back. So I need to go A to B. I don't go back C to go A, B. It's really, really important to teach that because um, a lot of athletes don't understand it. I'm not going to steal Chad's thunder because I know he's going to use some of this in his, uh, in his uh, sessions with you. And that's one thing we really want to key on. Is the athlete able to stabilize, decelerate under various functional loads? So we start to see, can we load them? Can we add resistance to something? But we're also making sure that they can stabilize and move properly. Um, is the athlete able to functional power? It's all range of motion. So they're able to vertical jump, horizontally jump, rotational power. Can they do those basic things? Um, and if they can't, how do we address that? You know, conditioning, should we start to expose the athlete to understand that what energy systems are? You know, what's an aerobic energy system? What's an anaerobic energy system? Intervals, you don't have to get too in depth with them, but they need to know how to separate that. The best athletes I have are the ones that ask questions and the ones that know what they need to do. They may only be with you four hours a week, two hours a week doing strength and conditioning. It's what they do the other, you know, other 166 hours of the week that, that actually makes a difference, as much of a difference that it does than when they're with you. Um, and then just getting into individually starting to understand health and nutrition. U17, U19, we start to add some more buckets. We start to add that mental performance, that injury management that we know is vitally important. Um, injured athletes aren't on the ice. They're not producing for you. Um, they become, you know, they have that mental performance issue, their confidence goes down. So we add that injury management component, specific energy system requirements where maybe we're looking at some kind of data that shows or something that shows what individually they need to do, how they need to train, et cetera. Um, and then just, we can go again through these components of athleticism, you know, how they move, did they lose? Now they're, now they're 17, did they lose that athleticism when they were 15 or 16? Um, is at this level, I think this is the level you really wanna to start to understand, does the athlete, is the athlete being measured for speed and impulse? When they're 11, 13, we just need them moving. I think we need them moving naturally, not keyed into just pure metrics and those types of things. But as they get to this age, they're gonna to start to get into a higher level camps, et cetera. They need to understand you know, how to measure and how to move and with speed and impulse. Strength and stability, um, I'll leave that to Chad. And then just specific power energy systems. Uh, you know, does an athlete actually understand what it takes, what, what a healthy athlete is? You know, they all, often think that I'm taking supplements, I'm doing this, they're working on this side of the wheel and not this side of the wheel. And we test them and say they're tired. Um, the best athletes in the NHL are the ones that are playing 82 games. They're the ones that can play over 300 games. Once they start to get that momentum, they really understand. I just had a, uh, an athlete that called me and said, you know, he started cooking for himself and he feels a huge difference in he's going to have a great season this year. And that's really when I know that they've taken a big step is when they take that specific health and nutrition and really, really own it. 
So when we, when we look at um, philosophies, you know, what everybody always says, what's your philosophy? Coaches come in, coaches come and go in the NHL. And I think as a strength coach, you have to understand what's the philosophy of the coach. You know, is the coach somebody that has high intensity practices? Well, then you probably don't need to incorporate that into your training because it's being taken care of on the ice. If it's not, maybe that's something you need to implement. Um, if they're doing speed work on the ice, you're probably not going to mirror that off the ice because they're already getting it on the ice. So, you know, think of yourself and think of the philosophy and what does, you, does your philosophy support your environment? Um, what does your personal coaching environment look like? You know, what are they like physically? What are the athletes like physically, mentally? Are they internally driven or not? You know, uh, what's their experience as a group off the ice? Do they know how to strengthen conditioning? Are you just starting off and saying, hey, look, I just got to teach them basics here and keep it very simple because they're not very experienced. And are there specific limitations you may have due to, you know, where you're training or schedule, et cetera. As Toby said, you know, not all of us have elaborate gyms, but can I do something that's purposeful? And that's what you'll see in Chad's uh, sessions is we tried to theme them um, and give you an idea of how to theme a session. Um, you know, so my environment is I got elite players. I got 19 to 37 year olds. Um, I, got to, I have to work through a collective bargaining agreement, contracts. I got testing and monitoring. Anything I do needs to be passed through the NHL to make sure that that's going to be cleared um, from an exercise selection point of view. Um, so that's a little bit more stringent than some of you may have. Um, I have an elite medical staff. So a lot of the testing that I do is, is based on having a really solid elite medical staff that we work really well together. Um, so I know that I can have them doing and looking at lots of portions of my sports performance programming and helping out. And there's always that integration and collaboration, which you'll hear over and over again. I think it's very important. And um, then we have an erratic uh, schedule. So, you know, where we're training and when we're training and how much we're training. It's very hard in the NHL to predict what's going to happen in a month from now and what your team's going to look like from a month from now because of uh, scheduling and just rigors of the games. So we have three, three week training camp. We have three preseason games, 82 games, three to four games a week. We're going to have an Olympic break right in the middle of the season this year. And then we know, you know, if, if you're going to win the whole thing, you got to win 16 games to win it all. And, um, the concept of that is again, take that higher view and see what, you know, what, what are your athletes like and how do you get them through a season uh, so that they're performing at the end. When you're doing the programming, I often see coaches have a certain mindset and, you know, the, they, they want to do a program, but it doesn't, doesn't pass that athlete sniff test. So do you have player buy-in? Does the player buy into what you're doing? Because if they don't buy in, It'll work in the short term, will not be successful in the long term. And I'm not saying get in, give in to them. I'm just saying make sure you're thinking as an athlete sometimes and not just as a coach. Um, does the programming affect the swagger of your team? And swagger means, you know, does it help the positivity of your team? Does it create that wolf pack? I mean, when teams are winning, they have a wolf pack attitude. And as strength and conditioning, we want to throw – fuel on the fire and gas on the fire to make that better. So does that programming affect it? Or did you do something to intervene uh, in the wrong way? Or do you need to change that swagger? The swagger is not good. You have to change the fun in the program or the way the program looks to make sure the mindset is, uh, is changing. And does it promote burnout or does it unite the team? You know, what's your personal philosophy on assessing your athletes? Um, have the players prepared to sustain a training camp all season? So, you know, I see often the testing is these guys need to be ready or these girls need to be ready on August the 15th. And I often see this and then they're no good in October. That doesn't help you whatsoever. So when you're assessing your athletes, some of the assessment needs to be you know, do they have room to grow? Because 
if your if your first day of your testing is on August 15th, but you don't play your first game until October 15th, that's a long time to try to figure out our athletes ready or are they not. Um, I pride my athletes being ready right away, but also that they're still playing well in February and March, April, May, they can keep going. So the programming needs to, needs to reflect that. Uh, do I need to test anything repeatedly during the season? Uh, is it a pass standard test or is there a measurable that you want the person to achieve? Some of the things we use is just a pass and some of it is measurable based on maybe a younger player that we want to say, hey, you need to get to here. This is what you're measuring. This is what a pro target is. Um, just simple things. If, if a, right now in the NHL, if, if you can't stand on one leg and broad jump uh, onto two feet, so a long jump onto two feet, if you can't do you know, 250 to 260, you're probably not able to play very well in the NHL anymore. It's just the standard that I've kind of created. Um, and I think it makes has a measurable uh, ability to it. Um, you know, is there specific individual testing I need to do with certain players or, or monitor them? So I know that this young player, if I don't stay on them on certain things, now I don't have a monitoring system, they don't see it as being valuable and they're not going to do it. So we have a system where we have team testing and then we have throughout the season individual testing based on the key performance indexes or development indexes that we know we have to have for that player. And then, you know, at the bottom, again, when I said earlier, are you biased to always say, you know, I've done this test my whole life. Okay, well, why are you doing it? What value does it bring to your team? What does it measure? Or is it just something you say, oh, well, I've just always done it. Okay, but let's try to think again. Let's try to step up and say, why are we doing it? You know, if it's a test that, you want it, it's really hard test and you need to see the resiliency in your players. Great. Check mark. I, I get that. But if it's just to test, just to test, um, it's probably something that you want to revisit. You know, hours testing, we have eight tests, uh, to established tests from the past. We have three functional tests that we do. We try to keep it very simple. Again, reminder that we have a certain time period we can do all this in, in the NHL. The NHLPA looks very closely into what we're measuring, where the data is going. Um, we have two on ice tests. We have one that's a mobility based test where you're moving forward and backwards and sprinting through. And then we have one that's, you know, that's a mountain type test that's building resiliency that we can see maximal testing um, for each player and see what they can do repetitively. We do two, uh, two repeats. And then is that setting up in, in, is it set up? to help with individual testing and monitoring uh, based on what they achieved at uh, training camp. So one of the things I, I see a lot of in programming is, you know, one thing we need to do is avoid the medium-based training. You know, things don't happen really well in here. And I, if I showed you some of the data of, you know, where heart rates and, and accelerometers and speed are, they're all very high. Heart rate goes up, speed goes up. Um, we don't have very many diesel engines in the NHL anymore. It, as I said earlier, it's getting faster and faster and faster. So we need to support that with highs and lows. Otherwise, our highs become our highs become a little bit lower and our lows become a bit higher. And we just sit in the middle and we wonder why our teams aren't getting faster. Uh, we don't play with speed. We can't think with speed and we can't perform better. And that's because a lot of times our practices get into this medium-based training. You know, Hussein Bolt doesn't stand, think about setting a world record um, or a sprinter a world record and say, geez, I think I'm going to run a bunch of 12 second 100 meters so that I can run nine seconds. It just doesn't happen. So we need to make sure that practices are purposeful and we don't get lulled into the CrossFit mentality of just medium based all the time. The game is fast. It's precise. It needs to have highs and lows. Um, one of the other things is, you know, People often say, I often ask, well, did you get, did you actually tell, sit down with your players and say, this is the programming, you know, this is why we need highs and lows. We can't just lull you guys into those middles. Um, you know, some things are going to be really boring. I tell my athletes something, it's like cows going in, they put their heads in the trough, 
they drink the water, they eat the hay. There's just some things that we're going to do, our warm-up routines, our injury prevention routines. We can't change them too much. We can put a little bit of lipstick on them and make them look nicer, but they're going to stay fairly similar because I know the time tested and true and I, we need them in our programming. And then just the importance of them personally being accountable and honest that uh, they need to get this done. We, we even do it with the professionals. We walk in and we say, look, we're just honesty coaches here. We're not actually strength coaches. We're honesty coaches. And when you're not honest with your training, you're going to get me in your face and I'm going to tell you what I think. But if you're accountable and you're honest and you stick with the programming and what the coaches want and what we want and what the medical staff wants, it works beautifully. And one thing to, to think about is, are you accounting for everything that these athletes are doing outside of just being with you on the ice? You know, individual training sessions that they might be doing offsite, other skills coaches, other training, you know, do they have tons of schoolwork? Do they have, do they have jobs? Are there other, are they in other sports? Um, those are things that we often don't account for when we look at our programming. And sometimes it backfires on us because we don't realize that this, this group or this person is doing extra work and we don't want to simulate that into to what performance could look like or is. Individual warm-up volumes. Um, I've had athletes, Milan McCulloch, when Milan McCulloch worked for us, we would train for 40 minutes before the game even started. And I mean hard training. This, like most people couldn't even get through his warm-up because he had been injured before he got to us. And we felt like we need to get his engine so high before he started the game that he would train and train. So his training outside of warming up for games would be very low because he's already done a 40 minute workout. I think sometimes we lose the thought of that and not taking advantage of warm ups as part of maybe a mini workout that we could do throughout the week. You know, this is something that I that I put together. That top component, that is what it's all about. The minutes of game performance, right? So if you stack those down and you say practice, so what, what's going to also, the other person's going to be, the athletes are going to be doing community engagement. So for us, that's meeting, that's uh, going off to charities, doing different things. That's the media that they have to do. You know, they have to do therapy. Some of them are intensely in therapy or they're early for therapy. You know, the off-ice training that we do the on ice skill, the practice, you know, how does that fit into what you're doing within your group? Obviously, maybe you don't have media and community engagement, but you might have other things in there that are taking energy, mental energy and physical energy from your athletes. It needs to be looked at. Once you get up to that higher view, you go, oh, that's why that athlete is tired. You know, it's got some things going on at home or they need, they've got so much schoolwork to stress about this. And I think it's their conditioning and it's not their conditioning. What are the other things that make up, you know, on ice performance? Just a concept of when are you going to do your programming? Pre-practice, post-practice. You know, I think the big thing is, do you do, do you do, is a practice or training more important on this day? So we do pre most of the time because we want in the season, we know the load and the idea is to get these guys competing for the number of shifts that they have per game as often as possible, as consistent as possible at the highest level. That's my entire concern. Three days a week or four days a week that those players are performing. The, the, the gym stuff is important, but what we stage it as usually is what is the most important thing. So in training camp, we might have high loads and, and coach says, look, you got to get them in the gym a little bit. You can do a little bit more loads and it can take away from practice. But I think that practice and games are the most comp important component of it. So I'm going to make sure that I'm going to manipulate my time, the amounts that I do based on that, those shifts of each player and that each player is absolutely flying when the curtains open. And I'll discuss that a little bit more in a bit. Um, individual versus group training. Often I see people go to individual training. I think it's fine. I think they should have a built-in component. All our players have sort of their built-in warm-ups and things that they need to be able to do. However, it does take away sometimes from the group component of 
this is a team and this guy, player A is over here and player B is over there. I don't know if that builds unity into achieving a common goal. Um, sometimes we'll do it and we may adjust it based on the team or the individuals that we have. How do you manage your injured, your injured athletes? Um, do you have a go-to therapist? Really, really important that you have somebody that you trust that, um, that can tell you exactly what the diagnosis is and make sure you know when and this is okay, the player can play or the player can't play. And do the athletes trust them? I've been in a number of different settings at a junior level, at lower, at higher, where I'm lucky to have a great staff of where we are now, but they just don't trust the therapist. And even though you trust them, they don't, and the two just don't work together. So you got to make sure that's a nice fit um, and make sure that there's a really good sync between, you know, collaboration of, uh, of the medical staff. Uh, are you focusing on items that can prove while, while they're injured? So I can't tell you how many times somebody just says, while they're injured, there's not really much we can do with them. We're doing processing with them. We're changing, we're trying visual. If somebody's completely immobilized, and has a bad back or whatever, we're still doing visual. We're working on mental performance. We're working on past injuries that we think might come up. So those are all things that I think sometimes we just see injured athletes and we put them over there. Remembering that putting an athlete on a side burner, at some point they need to come back and play for you. So you don't want them to be the injured athlete. You want them to feel like they're working on something it's going to make them better when they transition back onto the ice. Um, so it's really, really crucial. Crucial, You know, you can't just ask an, ask an athlete to do nothing and then they're going to perform for you. But if you, can, if you can work with them and say, okay, you're injured, but what can we do to make you better? You know, that bone is broken. It's going to take six weeks for that bone to heal. What are we going to do between now and then to make sure that, you know, you're better? You're a better athlete. You're a better player. Um, and then, you know, as we get through here, what's your plan if things don't go right? Because inevitably, we all think they're going to go right, and sometimes they don't. So do you push the team harder? Is it time to put push harder? Is it time to pull back? Um, that I don't know, and that's sort of a question for you guys. And I know you're all very intelligent, smart coaches that can understand does this need a push or does this need a pullback from, from a little bit of what I've been doing? Um, do you collaborate with the members of your coaching staff to find solutions or do you just go compartmentalize and say, Hey, look, I'm going to solve the solution. Um, I'm thinking that you probably have good coaches with you that have a lot of insight that can look up. Maybe they're at a higher view than you are and maybe they're lower, but that's the, that's, you know, trying to get good people with you to collaborate on those solutions. Um, do you do individual on ice adjustments? So what specifically do you need to address with a player to make them better? And I started with that a little bit earlier is I can't tell you how many times I've heard this athlete's not in shape, get them in the gym and give them, get them on the bike, get them running. Um, that's great, but we need to look at a little bit higher level and say, okay, is the conditioning a nutritional thing? You know, is it psychological? Are they haven't, are they having issues with their girlfriends or boyfriends? Um, is it physiological? Is it something that, that we can do in the gym to improve? Um, but we need to think of it as a bigger concept of, it's not just their conditioning. Um, it could be something a lot more. Um, and again, if I don't know what it is, am I a good enough coach to say, I really don't know, but I know this person knows and I'm gonna reference them and I need them to help me understand what they think is going on. And then just sort of lastly here is, you know, game performance is what the players are evaluated on. So that idea, that picture that I have is the player is evaluated based on how they play. We can say everything we want about how we got there, but ultimately, and I use the singing analogy of the best performers in the world, when they come out and sing, they're worried about singing. They're not over singing in the morning. They're singing enough so that when we go and watch them at a, at a concert or whatever, the curtains open, they step through. 
That's what I'm most concerned about. If a player performs, the elite, the elite performers understand this and they search for that best approach to perform when it counts. They know that's when they're being evaluated. That's when in the NHL, that's where they make their money is when they're in the playoffs and the curtains open, they step through. At night, 82 times a year, they step through those curtains and they perform. That's all I got, though. Absolutely. Can you hear me, Chris? Yeah, lots of info. <laughs> yeah, tons of info. And I, I, I think for you guys, Yanni, um, you know, Chris, obviously, through, through FitQuest, um, if guys want more, he, he can help as far as establishing strong, smart programs within um, various organizations and all. But any, any questions from our group? I figured you would have some Oleg. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you talked a lot about like the professional level. Yeah. What what would you say? Uh, practices for kids, dryland, before or after, and then the guys like 17, 18 years olds, uh, because uh, you know, for kids and for also for those junior guys, the development on the ice. It takes the mental uh, concentration and so on and so on. Uh, so, your comment on that? Yeah, I think I think uh, it, well, if, if you if you look at the purpose. So, if you want athletes that are um, engaged, and when we when I say before, sometimes it's just a quick activation of fifteen or twenty minutes. Um, of I'm going to do that because I know it's going to promote. They're going to be engaged mentally and physically when they get onto the ice so that you guys have them on the ice and they're prepared. So, you know, it's, they're not getting out there and you need to get them going. Um, with the younger athletes, for sure, you know, you want to keep them engaged so that they don't get to the ice and then you don't get enough out of them. I think, again, it comes back to the ice is the most important component of it. Um, off ice is very important based in maybe the off season. Uh, or if it's something that you want to work and build it, um, then then you could apply maybe a little bit before and a little bit after based on your schedule. But I, I still tend to believe that to me, it's it's about what the theme of that session is going to be. If it's just, you know what, today we're going to go out and do some flow drills. We want to work on a couple things, but it's not a really high intensity session. And maybe the session is before and it's hard. But if you say, you know, I want to, I want to make sure that my guys and my girls are ready to go um, when they get on the ice. Maybe it's, maybe that is a post workout, and maybe it's just a strength workout. At that point, it's less neurological, um, so you're just doing some conventional training, which means, you know, you're just doing some simple exercises. It's not very explosive. You can't expect them to try to in increase their explosiveness after they've just been on the ice for you, going hard for for an hour. Um, but it's really, it's really individualized as to what you want to get out of the practice or what you want to get out of the workout. I hope that, hope that it, I explained that properly. Yeah. Chris, um, and gentlemen who asked that coaches at under 18 national team, but we've got, uh, folks here that are coaching here in Riga. We have some in some of the smaller, uh, uh, centers around Latvia, things like that, um, where their resources may or may not be, um, you know, may not be equal. Right. Are there ways that they can do things, whether they're a big center or a small center that, that, that are effective and, 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 and help the young players, not just young players, but even some of the older players um, in, in, in that inequality of resources? Well, I think so. I mean, the, the funny thing that about it is until about five years ago in the NHL, we traveled, and we had very limited resources once we got to um, other than, you know, hotels, but on site, we had limited resources. We had, you know, a couple of kettlebells and uh, some bands and a few other things. I know Chad's going to try to attempt to show that he's not going to have a lot of equipment that he's working with, but he's going to show the ways of, of how you can get the most out of your athletes. Um, I think smart things of, you know, time under tension type, holding stability, uh, movement. Again, you know, we need to understand that 
applying force is incredibly important. And I'm, I'm very, I don't want anybody to think that I don't, we don't put our athletes under load or anything like that. Um, but we still need to be able to move a 170 pound or 130 pound athlete. They have to move their own body. So movement, um, stability, all those types of things. Chad's going to talk about them in his sessions to show, you know, athletes should be able to do this and then do this and then do this all which maybe apply, we apply a little bit of, of weight or resistance of some type. But again, there's so much we can do um, without, you know, the luxury of a big elaborate gym where we have, you know, the luxury of squat racks and, and, and lots of weights and, uh, you know, accelerometers and all those types of things. There's, there's a lot we can do and there's a lot that, that, that uh, we're doing ourselves with our, with our athletes here in Canada that are, that are in small, small local areas, or just get a portion of a, of an arena to, to do a workout with. Yeah, to just continue that, uh, I remember in March, you said if, if there is one thing that you would want to see in the player, for, like to choose, you would say speed. And uh, at this point, I was wondering, like wanted to ask like because we have here we have different ages right. coaches and stuff like that so uh, what about uh, what's the best age in your opinion to go really for for speed pretty much like make it like i don't know 60 80 percent of the practice something like i think that. i think if you don't get too early um can talk to you about my toby knows a little bit about my son's a very very dynamic fast athlete and everybody asked me at 14 we just went down to the united states and he ran the fastest 60 um, of all the 14 year olds in a baseball combine um and that's you know a canadian young canadian going down to the united states which is really big i've always thought of power and speed jump vertical jumping running speed at a young age I just think that if you wait too long, it's very hard when somebody comes to us and says, you know, I'm 16, I need to get faster. It doesn't mean we can't do it. So I also don't want to say that athlete can't do it. I've had a couple athletes, one that played on our team last year. And he said when he was 18, he was one of the slower athletes, but he worked on it. Um, I think those athletes often just don't know how to move with speed. They have it genetically. They just don't know how to move with speed. Um, so you want to harness the speed, but I think, um, I think if you start at a young age of, you know, 10, 10, 11, 12, I think they need to know that it's important to be fast. Um, that's why the concept of everything I do now is does the athlete understand it? We can sit back as coaches and understand everything. If the athlete doesn't see the importance, if you're not measuring 20 meter sprinting, um, 10 meter sprinting, five meter sprinting for an athlete, he's not going to think it's important. Um, if we don't measure that on the ice, if we don't measure it off the ice, they're not going to do that. They're not from a generation where we are, where we would want to jump higher and run faster. They're just not there. So we need to make sure that's implemented into our programming. So later on, that athlete's been going fast since the age of 10 years old. 15, we get them stronger. They're going to go faster and build from there. Um, I just think it's lacking a little bit that we're concentrating so much on skill acquisition, which slows speed down a lot of the time. And we don't do all out um, quick motions in various planes, fast, maximal uh, motions. That's kind of uh, on, on our, our end of things. Like we try and get the skill acquisition, the footwork and things like that. But in everything we do, we leave the kids at full speed, you know, trying to build it up uh, to that point. Right. Then I will continue for all for all guys. I would say I think uh, in Latvia we have uh, only about thirty games a right. season up to U seventeen. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty bad, but we 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 do have uh, so 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 less games. So if we look at uh, like training weeks and the practices on the ice so off the ice. Uh, what would you say should we practice every day on the ice and uh, take the gym before or after 
or should we like in a different age should we concentrate much more on this speed uh, stability and different practices off the ice well often we so sometimes we would get into a position where we're having weeks where we don't might be a week or 10 days when we have time um, just the way the schedules have gone over the years and we sit down and say okay well what's going to be important we're going to do a skilled session on that day let's build a heavy power speed dynamic workout that's a little bit longer um and because we know they're going to go on and do skills but it's not it's not fast skills so it's not what toby was talking about where you're really harnessing quick out of turns and making motions so that would be one day on the other day it's going to be a conditioning day on the ice it's going to be a mobility day off the ice so that you know again it might be a post practice mobility we're going to have a hard intense skate and we're going to we're going to pair that up with mobility um, because i think if you try to do hard on the ice and hard off the ice you just start to make that medium based training um, um, happen and if you do have time that you you run these little micro cycles of you know you uh, micro dose them of hey, this is going to be a hard day this is going to be an easy day hard day or a hard week and then how you progress them it's sort of hard to to know exactly without seeing your schedule and seeing you know um what game that might be is it game 17 of 30 is it game 22 of 30 um i think that's where you have to kind of look back but I'm, I'm more than willing to uh to chat with you offline and try to figure that out anybody else i i i i just have one off of that chris and and then we'll thank you we got to go over practice for tomorrow and try and wrap it up here in about five minutes but um something that i I struggle with, and it goes off of what Oleg's uh, question was, that um, you know people always ask us to do things in the spring, do spring teams, tournament teams, do things early in the summer and things like that. And we, we've always stayed away from that. And you look at NHL athletes or Olympic athletes, not just uh, in hockey, but all the uh, times, and they give their bodies time to recover. Um, could you just talk about that in, in you know three minutes maybe on, allowing the body a chance to recover so that they can train at their optimal level one. And should that be also built in during the season? So, you know, I've got 10 and 12 year olds that, that, that are going all spring. They're, they're playing hockey 12 months a year. They're not recovering. Um, and then, you know, I talked to a, a friend who's, whose sister is peekaboo street, Olympic world champion, you know, uh, downhill skier. And she used to get done in March and she wouldn't touch the snow again until July. Cause when she wanted to start training, she wanted her body to be at hundred percent. So just a little bit on that off season and then giving your body a chance to recover even during season. Yeah. And funny on that though, is we've, I think, I don't know if I said this in our last talk, but we've actually looked at research on like on some of the, the injuries that people are having. Most injuries are happening because of fatigue. But the injuries may not be injuries all the time just because the athlete wants to have that time off. They know if they tweak their groin that they're not going to be on the ice for 10 days. So I can't tell you how many times young athletes have come into our clinic and said, you know, like my groin, I don't know what it is, my groin, my back, because they know that's a two week or a 10 day um, off, you know, staying away from that. And sometimes we right immediately ask, is that a fatigue thing? Is that a mental fatigue thing? Most athletes, I mean, our guys, we try to keep them off if they finish in May or June. They're, they're off the ice for at least a month with nothing. Um, if they start back whatsoever, they're doing very low-grade um, activities. Again, I go back to, you know, like when you were talking about those 30 games. Those 30 games is when you're evaluated. That's when you want your athletes speaking. Some components of what we're doing in strength and conditioning or with skills or whatever is we think – we're losing the battle to win the war, right? Or losing the war to win the battle, whatever that one is, is that we're doing too much. We're trying to get all the focus on, again, singing in the summer and how important it is when the most important part is when that athlete steps through and plays the games that are, that are important, that plays when it's important, that they're fresh, that they're injury free. The worst thing in the world is getting an athlete coming into a training camp and trying to start uh, injured what happens is that even if they are injured or tired, even if they get back in time, they, they just chase all season. They never, ever get to back up to the level 
that everybody else is doing because the game is so fast now in the NHL in playoffs. When you see how explosive and how dynamic those are, there is literally nothing they're doing off the ice other than just trying to keep these guys together and shut them down. And so they recover for the next day. And that's because they know that they're trying to get them 7 p.m. tomorrow night. I need this guy to play 10 shifts at his maximal level. So what he did in the summer could affect those 10 shifts in March or sorry, in May or in June that he did something in the summer that didn't make sense. And now he's not recovered and he gets injured or he just doesn't have the ability to play at the highest level. So in, in summarizing, I think you're hundred percent right. There's way too much people just being busy. Busy is not good. Purposeful is what you need. Be purposeful with everything you do. The athletes will appreciate it. They'll be better. They'll, they'll understand they're smarter than they ever was. They're going to see you as a resource um, and they're going to perform. Once again, Chris, um, we know you're busy and things are getting busier uh, every week for you guys. Um, the guys here have been phenomenal. Uh, the Federation um, is very appreciative of it. And uh, Matt and I and, and our group uh, can't thank you enough. So wishing you a great season and uh, some wins out of the shoot. So uh, be well and thanks, and thanks again. I know. Thank you. I'm like Daryl. Um, I, I, I could talk about this stuff all day, especially with young athletes, because they're the next, they're the future. And there's, they're really where we can mold them in the development side of things. So um, I'm going to be getting back into doing a lot more on the younger level, because I think that's where I think if you look at any good organization, they've taken the best coaches and sometimes put them down. Tennis Canada did that um, with um, and we've got some pretty good athletes at that level because we can all use our knowledge and apply it and, and uh, collaborate and just make this thing better. Chris, thanks again. Take care, everybody. Bye. Um, and then for everyone who is on the call, um, we're just going to wrap up. Um, can't thank you enough once again. Um, uh, we all appreciate you being on and, and hope some of the information has been uh, uh, very well received. If you want anything more, we will get it out. We'll get it to uh, Yanni and they can distribute it out. Uh, Chris's presentation and things like that. Um, so tomorrow night, whoever's on, please be quiet. Um, Tomorrow night, uh, we're going to do a presentation here just about implementing some of the skills and, and how you can break a single skill down. Um, uh, Dennis, uh, Dennis Miller is going to uh, present that. Dennis uh, was the development director uh, with the Buffalo Sabres. We're fortunate to have him here with us um, uh, on the ice this week. Um, he also uh, served as an assistant coach in Buffalo for many years, um, but he's about development and teaching. Um, and then followed that for everyone online is a gentleman by the name of Joe Batista. And he's a unique guy. Um, he built a program for nothing. He raised $114 million single-handedly in order to build a program and uh, at Penn State University, both for the men and for the women, and just talk a little bit about taking ideas and making them work. So hope everyone online is back with us tomorrow. And uh, uh, we're going to sign off here and just talk a little bit to the guys that are here with us today. So thank you very much again.